All right. Uh, we should be live now. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in to the uh, Grey Room podcast with Mark Sargent today. This is the second time Mark Sargent is appearing to answer some questions that we got from the Discord community and to talk further about Flat Earth and various other conspiracies. Um, so would you like to say anything before we start off, Mark? Uh, boy, uh, I don't know if... I don't know what my opening statement should be because I've been so distracted by this whole virus thing. Um, only that whatever I say, you know, don't uh, take it with a grain of salt and uh, do your own research and ask questions because none of what I'm going to talk about is secret in any way. I don't have any proprietary information. I'm not some sort of weird whistleblower or um, secret agent. And if I am an agent, I am the greatest in the world. There you go. That's my <laughs> opening statement. <laughs> all right that's a good one um so give me a second let me just all right there we go looking good so to start off one of the questions that the right. discord community uh would like you to answer is mm -hmm. um from japanese daikon farmer he says hi there just want to know you did you always believe the earth was flat or did you come to that conclusion later in life was there a particular figure or moment that helped you arrive to your current beliefs? Uh, yeah. So, no. Like 99% of the people that are in the community, I absolutely did not believe in Flat Earth. Uh, I thought it was dumb, stupid, and just about every other name you could throw at it. Until, in fact, and, and I was into conspiracies. So I had looked at all the, the weird conspiracies. I had looked at Bigfoot and Elvis being alive and aliens and the Loch Ness Monster and so on and so on. And I had an opinion on, on just about everything that you could think of. Um, but Flat Earth was still stupid until 2014 when, you know, because I'm, cause I'm older, kids. Uh, when I just said, you know what, I might as well look into this because it's on my bucket list and said I could stomp it out in a weekend. And so in the summer of 2014, that's when I started digging into it and just could not uh, get my head around it for the longest time until February 2015, where I said, all right, I give up. I can't prove the globe anymore in a court of law. So that's when I made Flat Earth Clues. And that was five years ago. And here we are. Okay. Uh, so there's an answer to that. He came to this conclusion about five years ago. So yeah. five years ago, mm -hmm. what exactly... Uh, oh, what flipped me? What, what finally did it? Yeah, yeah. what was the exact thing? For me, it wasn't what most people get. Most people get into it because of the, um, uh, the long distance photography. That's, that's what, how most people get into it now. But when I made the clues, I didn't even touch long distance, distance photography because I didn't know anything about it. Uh, again, a whole five years ago, kids. Uh, but for me, it was the Antarctic Treaty, which is the only unbroken treaty in the history of treaties. You know, we've got hundreds and hundreds of nations out there, and there's so many treaties that have been formed over the years. And the Antarctic Treaty of 1959 says that no corporation from any country, no matter how big or powerful they are, can set up shop in Antarctica ever for any reason. And it's bulletproof. It's absolutely ironclad. And it's not even up for review until 2041. And no one's even challenged it. That's the part that threw me, you know, we, for the, at least in the United States, capitalism, you know, the most of the capitalistic world thrives on money and greed and power. And that's the, you know, it's 99 out of 100 problems. That's what uh, it revolves around is money. And we can start fracking in your backyard tomorrow. If we wanted to, it just takes, it just takes a little effort. We can grease the, the wheels for that. And yet you're not even allowed to talk about the Antarctic Treaty. So, you know, like the United Kingdom, you know, British Petroleum, we, we already know there's oil down there. So why aren't we going after the oil? It's one of our, our hottest commodities. And yet they're not even allowed to run a full page ad in any newspaper or do anything online saying how great it would be to go down there. It's one of those really great kept secrets that's under the guise of national security now they'll veil it in environmentalism they'll say well because you know the environmental concerns like we're talking about there's no there's no plant life there's no animal life there's nothing 
It's just ice and snow at a really high altitude. That's all there is. So that was, yeah, that was the thing that flipped me. That, that said, yeah, you know what? That's a huge red flag. Because what, what conspiracy is bigger than money? There is only one, and that's it. Other than, of course, you know, the existence of God. But that's a whole other thing. Another question from Discord is coming from Viv. Mm -hmm. He says, why do you think you know more than an aerospace engineer with regards to the shape of the planet? Oh, I'll, I'll go even further than that. Um, because people have asked me, oh, oh you're, you're smarter than Einstein and, and Stephen Hawking and everybody and Carl Sagan and guys like that. It's like, no, no. I mean, they've got some fantastic math skills. No question. But their math skills and their theories are based on other people's theories, which are based on other people's theories. If the foundation theory is wrong, then all of it is wrong. I'm not saying that they aren't brilliant men. No question. Um, yeah. But very rarely do scientists double check the foundations that their work is based on. They assume it's cor it's cor yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's true. That's I've never heard that take. That's a very interesting point you're making, and I, yeah, that's I've never heard that before. That uh, is true. Well, there's a there's a great quote. If you want to go take that even further, there's a great quote by Nikola Tesla, uh, who who many consider to be you know one of the greatest of all, even though his his work was torn down and stolen which was he said that science just builds equations on top of equations to where when you get to a certain height the numbers are just meaningless because the you know they again they just everyone assumes that the previous person's work is correct um so again when it comes I'm, I'm not saying that i'm i'm smarter than him i'm saying i just piece some stuff together and i'd like to qu I'll qualify it with this um, can I prove to you right now that the, um, that the earth is flat, that we live in some sort of enclosed system, some building? No, I cannot. But can I create so much reasonable doubt in the globe that you have nowhere else to turn but some sort of flat earth model? Yeah, I can. I can do that all day long. And science will come back and say, well, reasonable doubt isn't enough. And I go, really? Tell that to the legal system because reasonable hmm. doubt will get you off every day. A every day. Reasonable doubt works. And that's re that's where we start, uh, and you know the globe doesn't have anything to stand on. So there you go. Uh, so as a follow up, Viv also said everything is based on axioms. What reason does he have to doubt these axioms? <sighs> because, and I'll, I'll I'll try not to use too many movie quotes this time around, but we the if anything. Uh, the, what's happening now with the whole virus is proof of it, which is we believe the world that is presented to us. If somebody in a lab coat tells you something, you give them the credibility, you give them the power because, well, they're, they're more intelligent than you. So, and, and we don't question it after a while. We, it's a slippery slope. So when a scientist says, this is the boiling temperature of water at sea level, well, that's something I can test myself. I get a fire, get a pot with some water and get a temperature thing and I can measure it. I can, and we can go to different altitudes and test this. However, when they go to you and say, this is what the core of the earth looks like. Ooh, that's, that's a whole nother thing. Because remember, the deepest hole ever drilled. Remember, the core of the earth is supposedly 4,000 miles straight down. What's the deepest hole ever drilled? 2,000, 1,000, 100, 10. Deepest hole ever drilled is 8 miles. So why are they showing you cross sections that show you detailed plans of how the earth is laid out? Don't tell me it's seismic radar or anything like that. They can't show you strata or where everything is. It's a guess. It's an absolute guess. It's not that the axioms are true. You just believe what is told to you. I'll give you another one real quick for this guy, which is um, the George Orwell thing, which I love so much from 1946. So George Orwell, not a flat earth guy, but he was really curious of how, why people believe scientists all the time. Yeah. And he said, he goes, he goes, you got to go to anyone on the street, and ask them, this is 1946, mind you, how they know the earth is a globe. They will immediately, immediately snap their fingers and go, it's a globe. We know this. It is known. Game of Thrones reference. It is known. It's a, it's a given. And then you say, really? How do you know? They won't, they don't have an answer. And I thought that he thought that was really, really curious because remember, NASA wasn't even founded until 1958, 12 years later. So how did everybody know in 1946 that the Earth was a globe? They didn't know. They were told. And that's, that's the difference here. You know, and let me, let me tie it all the way back to what's happening now with the virus. And I'm not going to give it its full name for various reasons. But, you know, you're told you, that the media is pounding on all channels so often. Be afraid. This is what it is. Be afraid. This is what it is. Even though the numbers do not in any way, shape, or form justify the huge overreaction 
for this. It, you know, 80% of the world's workforce is now not doing anything for just a tiny amount of people. And, uh, but you are told it is, it is deadly. Be afraid, you know, distance, do all these things to where I would even say this, uh, I'm sorry, let me end this question with this. If the media came out tomorrow and said, starting next week, everyone has to wear yellow masks, yellow masks, and they gave no reason whatsoever. I guarantee you that by next week, you will see people wearing yellow masks that they handmade. For whatever reason why because the media we believe what's on tv something that richard nixon said back in the 70s we we not only do we believe it we follow it so there you go there's your axiom another answer uh posed by dr goosh goosh mm -hmm. is do you think that every single sovereign nation which has a space program about 72 of them <laughs> as well as all private companies that launch satellites yeah. are in a grand conspiracy to conceal the fact that the earth is flat if so why uh, not not everyone that works in the space agency so let's just let's take it all the way back to nasa for example do i think that everyone that works at nasa thousands and thousands of people are in on it no of course not um, compartmentalization works for everything uh, it starts with the military and it ex expands from there. And don't forget, NASA is absolutely a military organization. No, they don't carry guns. They smile for the camera. They wear all white. But they are absolutely, uniquely, the Department of Defense, built on missile technology from the still burning embers of the Nazi war machine. So the only guys that need to know in any space program are the telemetry guys. That's it. And whoever their bosses are. Uh, and I'll take that straight out of Capricorn One, the movie from the late 70s, which is the, because once the rocket, if you work for a rocket company and you build whatever it is and you build the fuel system and you build the capsule system, build whatever the launch system is, that's fine. But the rocket goes up and then just goes horizontal. When the rocket goes out of view, that's when it really matters because that's just data that says, oh, OK, well, you can't see the rocket anymore, but here's where it is. Those are the only numbers you have to fake. And that takes a very, very small amount of people. And then you can just make it whatever you want because you remember, you can't see it. So you're just using computer graphics at that point saying, here's where the rocket is now. You know, cause people forget like last year, Israel supposedly face planted a, a, a capsule into the moon. Nobody even talks about it. They did it for like pennies on the dollar. And, you know, even though there was like no footage of it whatsoever, it was all computer graphics and it crashed. And they said, oh, the mission was a failure. Ta-da! <laughs> they went home. Roll credits. It was brilliant. So, um, no, the, it, no, it, at, only at the highest levels do these other um, space agencies and private companies, only at the highest levels. Uh, and you got to remember, the, 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 even though you may make a satellite, you don't deploy it yourself. You can make a satellite, but you, only, you go through a very, very small amount of companies that actually have launch capability. And that's, and, and that's an interesting point you're making, because uh, I have a family member who works for a company who manufactures satellites, and he... Well, you know, while he is a smart man, he is working on a tiny part of this project, right? Oh, yeah. So, like you said, I mean, that is, is another interesting point. Just the telemetry um, guys would uh, would have to know about that. That's, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah the, if, you, if you ever get the chance, watch Capricorn 1. There's a great scene. It was one of the spookiest scenes I'd ever, I'd ever seen in cinema where a telemetry guy, one of the junior telemetry guys, wrote his own program and figured out that the signal was actually being broadcast from you know, an Air Force base that was very, very close. And the second he tried to even talk about it, he was gone. <laughs> they, they disappeared him for off, off camera, and that was it. You never saw him again, and they erased his entire life to where you know his friend was like going, went to his house to see where he was. There was another person living there. All the magazines had the correct label address. It was like literally he was erased from the database. It was just fascinating. So anyway, there you go. Um, a question coming from Very Confused is how do you explain a difference in atmospheric pressure at different altitudes? Oh, are you kidding? That's that's easy. Uh, that In fact, the fact that you have atmospheric pressure means that you're in a pressurized system, something with a dome. I'll, I'll take it back. We'll go the other way, which is to a question to him is how does our atmosphere stay here? Why is our atmosphere stay here? And then I'll give you know, here's the thought experiment. I don't remember if I talked about it last time, which is, OK, you're in your room right now. Right. There's oxygen, you know, a little bit of oxygen. It's mostly nitrogen, 80, 20, roughly. We'll forget about the trace gases. All right. Let's say the, the floor above you is a gas chamber. It doesn't even have to be very big. Let's say it's the size of a bus. 
right, above you with a valve in the ceiling. You, you pop that valve. What happens? You know what happens. It's instant. It's violent. The, the air, it's not like the movies. The air instantly equalizes between you and upstairs, right? And you're probably going to black out. You might even die. So the question is, why didn't gravity, because that's the answer everyone's going to give, why didn't gravity keep the air in your room instead of going upstairs? Why not? And that's the, the, the contest which I throw at everybody is what wins, a vacuum or gravity? Vacuum always wins. Always, always, always. Um, when you suck a soda at, with using a straw out of a glass, why doesn't the, uh, the soda stay in the glass? Well, because you use a vacuum force to pull it out. So the follow-up question to that is when you go outside, why doesn't... Um, why doesn't the atmosphere just fly off into space? And if you go to say gravity, oh, you mean the exact same gravity that couldn't even hold the atmosphere in your room, but it's going to hold it to the ground? I actually had a guy come in and say, well, there's so much more gravity. It's like, no, it's all relative. We're talking about the, the biggest vacuum chamber of all, if you believe in space. So atmospheric pressure is exactly that. Uh, it gets thinner, no different than water pressure. Again, remember, when you're um, uh, swimming and you're only 10 feet down, a little bit of washer, water pressure. You go 400 feet down, you're going to be close to being dead. If you go 3,000 feet down, it'll crush even our best submarines, except for, you know, the bathys gaps and stuff like that. So, yeah, atmospheric pressure absolutely screams uh, enclosed system. Um, from base... Um, yes? Oh, yeah, you go ahead, Nico. I was just going to ask real fast, because isn't that what the ozone layer is for, is to trap those gases in the ah, There you go. Okay, which I will follow up. If you want to use the ozone or any of the hydrocarbons or fluorocarbons or whatever, I'll, I'll give you another thought experiment. When you let go of a helium balloon, what happens? It floats up. Why? Because helium is lighter. By the way, it's not just gravity we're talking about here. It's also density. In a pressurized system, density has a lot to do with it. So like when you take a ball yeah. and you put it, push it underwater, why does it pop back up? Density. Sure. Same, same, same thing with helium balloon. So when a helium balloon goes up high enough, let's assume it doesn't burst, right? Let's say it gets up high enough to where the ozone is. Why doesn't it fly off into space? In fact, the, the follow-up question to that is, where? because no scientist can answer this, for whatever, not with any accuracy, where does our atmosphere end and space begin? The vacuum of space, the emptiness of space, because we're talking about molecules versus no molecules. It is a law of thermodynamics, which is pressure cannot exist next to no pressure without a barrier. Plain and yeah. simple. I mean, even like when you blow a couple uh, breaths into a balloon, you know, why does it do that? And, and you let go of the balloon, what happens? It's going to fly off. Why does a basketball, why is a basketball a basketball when you pump it up? It's because you pumped some extra atmosphere in it. But when you're, you know, and you, you can look this up online. This is not hard stuff to find. If you go into any YouTube video, say something in a vacuum, whether it's a soda can or a basketball or a Stretch Armstrong or whatever it is, most things inside a little vacuum box will eventually expand and then blow up, detonate. We don't we don't see that with the atmosphere or spacesuits for that matter, which is the only other thing that violates the law of thermodynamics. But that's another thing. Um, another question coming from Viv once again is: Can you measure that being shot in the face is deadly, or would you accept that a scientist telling you this, or would you accept if a scientist told you this? The oh, I see what you're saying there. Um, no, well, yeah, of course. It, that's that's probably the, the a bad test. I, I know where he's going with it. That's probably not the best example to use, which is look, being shot in the face. You can test it yourself. What I'm saying, if you can test it yourself, it's if it's repeatable fairly easily, not just from the academic community, but by budding scientists, then yes, of course, I'll believe it. And we have plenty of examples, especially in war, people getting shot in the face all day long or domestic crime or whatever you want to call it. But if you can't test it yourself, and science has a real hard time repeating it, and on the on the, on the ground level, then why should I believe it? Again, and the, why was all the and then why was all the telemetry data off the Apollo Eleven mission just gone? Uh, but is, yeah, well, well, heck, we we can go even one step further. But, um, here, let me let me dump. Did I did I dump you guys the um, uh, the Apollo picture the last time we talked? Did I do that? Uh, I don't believe no, so. here. Here, let me do this for you really fast. So take two seconds. I will throw it into. And that, that's the point with with my comment. It's like okay, well, with the whole shooting in the face thing. Well, that's something you don't really need to build. You don't need to uh, build off of that. There's tons of examples of that. Right. When we're dealing with something as complex as this, I mean, 
why is the telemetry data off of the Apollo 11 mission just apparently missing? Like, yeah. that, you know. And and I'll believe, don't get me wrong, I love science. And, you know, look, I came from a, a tech background. And I love science fiction. And I love everything about science. But science has taken leaps of faith that the you know usually is reserved for religion and they're calling it absolute fact so what i threw in there like for example would be the um just a random shot from apollo 12 which was taken in 1969 nice little high resolution pic and there's a whole there's many things wrong with this image and yet because it was shown in mainstream in magazines back in 1969 people were like oh well there you go you're, you're there on the moon it's like yeah, but nothing makes sense in the picture. It's like, yeah, but it's mainstream, so it's real. Because the news doesn't lie. Ever. And for those people that are saying there's no fake news, I follow up with this little thing. Ready? You're absolutely right. There is no fake news. And I don't know what your political leanings are, but bear with me for one second. So I say there's no fake news. Everything that CNN says is absolutely true. And everything that Fox News says is absolutely true. Well, depending on where you lean, you know full well where that's going. No, nobody, either you're a Democrat or Republican, you're not going to agree with both those statements. Both sides agree that somebody's lying. Really? Who is it? It depends what your leanings are. So when it comes to this image right here, it's like, all right, well, this is Apollo 12 shot. It's absolutely true. Except that, for example, the shadows should be only going in one direction because if there's only one light source, the sun, there should, shadows should only be leaning in one direction, not f yeah. not four. Yeah. And it's like, okay, that, that only happens if the light source is really, really, really close. Uh, the, there's no blast crater underneath the, uh, the module. You know, there's 10,000 pounds of thrust for that thing. And yet there isn't a single thing. There's nothing out of place. Yeah. Um, the, my favorite, of course, is the dish, which most people don't even know it was there. It's not even in a lot of shots. That dish, there's a little VHF transmitter with a battery powered, you know, um, thing that's, that's boosting it. And it may be on a good day. You can look this up. It's not hard. And this is 1969. We did not have the, the best stuff back then. Maybe had a, on a good day, had a range of 50 miles and that would be pumping out Morse code. And yet they tell us, it's like, oh, no, no, this thing is pumping out 10 frames of color video a second and two-way communications with pinpoint accuracy through the Van Allen belt over a quarter million miles away. I was like, what? Do you know what sort of, you know what sort of system you would have to do to generate that? We have, dead, this, we have dead spots with cell phones right now. This, uh, this was the exact argument. Um, I was even speaking with um, <clears throat> with my father with recently because he was in the military, yeah. um, he, and he was explaining how you know they could, you know, he, he worked in a Faraday a Faraday chamber and he was doing communications and he was saying how even back, you know, in the back around this time yeah. where this picture was taken, you know, they were able to you know communicate uh, you know with with mil with military communication across the country maybe to different continents, so he doesn't think it's a far stretch. I mean, how would you back then, even on the Apollo 11 mission, communicate, like he's calling from the White House, he's calling to the moon? Yeah. Like, I don't understand how they had that technology at that point. Like the first satellite wasn't even launched too far from that. I think it was launched after that. Even. Well, like, I, the, 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 I mean, the satellites were very, very, very basic. I mean, Sputnik was in 1958. Um, but even 10 years later, you know, we didn't exactly. use them. They were not advanced in the slightest. Plus, this is an analog system. You know, you're looking at something. It's like, how do you digitally line up this shot if you're off by even the slightest millimeter? And remember, the, the, the Earth is moving. <laughs> it's turning. Yeah. Everything is in motion. How are you getting the communications? It's, it's ludicrous. But because it was on TV, it worked. And let me throw one more out at you, which is the spacesuits. The spacesuits is brilliant, which is, again, uh, why isn't a spacesuit a basketball? Why doesn't a spacesuit? Remember, you put a basketball in a vacuum chamber, it goes really, really tight, and then it explodes. And yet, these astronauts were running around, and they have perfect, you know, elbows move just fine, knees move fine, you can, you can hook things up with your fingers, your fingers work fine, no problem whatsoever. And the reason they got away with it is because it was on television. The early, you can look this up, not secret information. The, um, the early spacesuits were made out of plastic, metal. Uh, they were boxy. I mean, they were ridiculous. They looked like a bad B movie because they're like, look, we got to protect ourselves against a vacuum. And somebody comes along and they say, you know what? 
Nobody knows anything about physics. Just use a freaking soft suit. We'll run it. No one will question it. They'll say, well, there it is. It just works just fine. <laughs> and they did. It was brilliant because the average person doesn't know anything about physics, including me. I didn't know. And then I started looking in this like, wait a minute. How are you even pulling this off? So what else you got? Um, yeah. Viv, uh, to follow up, another gun-related question is, how do you reconcile when I have to shoot, you know, a gun in excess of 100, or, sorry, 1,000 yards? Yeah. I have to take into account the Earth's rotation in order to hit a target yeah. on top of assumptions for wind. Yeah, you don't. And I'm a shooter, let me tell you. I've <laughs> shot a lot of things in my life, and I've got a subject matter list. I've got a playlist on my channel called the... Um, uh, flat Earth testimony shows by subject matters, and I've got snipers, I've got artillery guys. They're shooting far, far greater distances than one mile. If even if you're using what a 50 cal, right? No, the you, you've got two things on your scope. Every scope that's ever been used, we'll just use small arms for a second here. Every scope has two things: windage and elevation. There's nothing on a scope that has anything to do with curvature or Coriolis effect, which is also the spin of the Earth which you should be taking into effect. If you're taking into the curvature of the earth, no, you're not. You're taking in range. If you, the curvature of the earth, what, you're not shooting with curvature, you're shooting with distance, which is on the side, which is called range. You know, that's that's yep. your distance, wind, windage and distance. Uh, if you're shooting longer than a mile, then we, I've talked to howitzer guys, tank guys, missile guys, every every type of guy you can think of in the military, and they all say the same thing. And they say, when you're firing ranges, howitzers shooting 20, 30 miles, missiles 50 miles and longer, you know, these guys should be taking into huge amounts of things, including, again, the big one here is the Coriolis effect. Because, remember, if you believe in the globe, that it's spinning 1,000 miles an hour around down, 1,000 miles an hour at the equator, but it's like a merry-go-round. So at the North Pole, the South Pole, it's spinning at zero miles an hour. Because remember, if you stand in the middle of the merry-go-round, you don't feel anything. If you're on the outside, you're going to get thrown off eventually. So if you're in the middle of the United States, it's not spinning at 1,000 miles an hour. Maybe spinning at 700 miles an hour or 600 and change, depending on where you are. Every okay. military guy has told me the exact same thing. They said, oh, yeah, there's charts out there. We don't use them. We've heard about the curvature of the earth. And we've heard about the spin of the earth. We never put it into practice ever, ever, ever. It is never in a firing solution ever. Because if it was in the firing solution, if you're in the battlefield, do you know how complex you would have to be depending? Because remember, it's not just windage and elevation anymore. If it's a globe that's spinning at that point, you're thinking, oh crap, which way am I facing? Because the spin of the earth is going to affect it and the curvature of the earth on top of that. No. Nope, it's not there. Ne never was. Please, by all means, check out the testimony shows. Everybody, and I, they're all on record for saying the same thing. Uh, one moment. Uh, so from very confused, he says, can you account for the fact that the atmosphere forms a gradient and that it does not suddenly end at the edge of space? He says on top of this, you cannot deny that the atmosphere is a gradient. No, no, I'm, I'm, I, I, I get where he's going. No, of course the atmosphere is a gradient. Again, no different than water is a gradient. When you are diving into the ocean, the top layer of the ocean is very, there's no pressure on it. But when you go down, forget about the light source that you lose in less than 200 feet. When you go down to 1,000 feet, you will not survive it. Why? Because there's greater atmospheric pressure. When you get up to space, no, you're absolutely, that's my, my point. It's where does space, where does our atmosphere end and space begin? Because the vacuum of space, if you believe in the solar system and space, that means it's a pure vacuum out there. And any, vol, any molecules that are sitting there are going to be ripped off, ripped off instantly. So tell me, tell me where space begins. Tell me where exactly where space begins. The gradient doesn't, doesn't help. It violates the law of thermodynamics. Look it up. Pressure cannot exist next to non-pressure without a container. No one ever talks about this. But it is, it's not a guideline. It is not a rule. It is a law. It cannot be violated. There you go. Um, so Ariel, CEO of Space, says, uh, Why do battleship gunnery tables take into account Earth's curvature? And I left a picture that he sent me. Uh, in the chat, they can check it out. Yep, the chart exists. Oh, I've seen this chart, no question. They don't use it, ever. Find me a guy that uses it. And on top of it, find me the Coriolis effect. 
because the battleships we can shoot for what is it 30 40 miles depending on what what inch gun you're talking about here Wh where's the coriolis effect meaning you should be if you're going to take into the count the curvature you're not taking out curvature you're just talking about distance that's all you're talking about here where's the coriolis effect meaning that chart should be way way bigger and should take into account geography Meaning, depending on what ocean you're on, will affect the spin of the projectile based on the spin of the Earth. Never happens. Again, go to any testimony show. Find me, find me a guy. I'm not picking on women. Find me a person in the military that factors in the curvature and the Coriolis effect when they're actually firing. I've seen this chart. Everyone says, "Oh yeah, it's in the book." We never use it, ever. Um. Another exactly. question from Base Groip is, are you willing to be forthright in pointing out the group that is responsible for the round earth conspiracy? <laughs> Interesting verbiage. Uh, <laughs> is, there's nobody, nobody, the round earth conspiracy is, oh, that's a weird way of putting it. All right, let me, let me, let me I'll, I'll do it in two parts. Uh, the first one's pretty easy, and that is, first off, human beings have nothing. Our civilization has nothing to do with the round earth conspiracy itself, only that we're keeping the secret. Meaning that even our best and brightest, because our technology is has not been really good for that long. Remember, 20 years ago, we didn't even have HD TV. That's, that's how recent we are. So what I'm saying is we didn't even know for sure. Even our best and brightest didn't know until about 1960. Because we just didn't have the tech to figure it out. Uh, we didn't even have decent planes, really, until the 50s. And jets weren't... I mean, remember, we were still using prop planes for a long time. So if you didn't figure it out until 1960, what, what happened at that point? Well, you're just keeping the secret. The question was, who introduced it in the first place 500 years ago? And I think that was, in part, the builders of the place itself. Meaning, whoever created this place wanted... And I talked about this in the clues. You... you eventually you want to create some solar sol some sort of solar system model because you want people to not look at the fence meaning human beings hate and perfect example of what we're going through right now hate confinement we hate it hate it hate it jail is a punishment for a reason because we hate confinement and it doesn't matter how great it or big it is so, uh, i use the um uh the wildlife preserve example so a wildlife preserve you put you know 20 buffalo in it hell you could put 50 buffalo it doesn't really matter a thousand acre wildlife preserve buffalo could care less they got water and food and trees and everything's great any animal you put in there fantastic they love it you put 10 people in that same thousand acre wildlife preserve all they're going to care about is one thing why is there an edge here why is there a wall here what's 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 the fence what why is why are we on this side who's on the other side who built the fence have we angered the fence makers maybe we should sacrifice things to the fence get some buffalo and then a religion is formed almost immediately because of it so again 500 years ago that's what you do you have to stop humanity from looking for the edge and that was the easiest way to do it say so all you have to do is tell them there is no edge that's it. There, there's nothing to look for. And then in case they decide to go out there, you make some wonderful negative reinforcements. You know, Antarctica is just a horrible place that just screams, go away. And because you will turn back on your own, you don't think there's anything sinister. So you, the last thing you're going to do with Antarctica is put some 80 foot frost giants there holding axes saying, go away. You know, better off to just put a whole bunch of snow and make the altitude so high and no animal life, no plant life. So you have to carry every all your um, uh, all your resources with you. And that's it. Um, I'm going to interject real fast yeah. and ask, since we're on the topic of Antarctica, yeah. uh, do you believe in the Alfred Hitchcock's theories uh, finding like uh, archaeological evidence of civilizations existing there? Oh, sure. Sure. In fact, Alfred Hitchcock, um, I, I love some, I love the way the man thought. Um, I was a big fan of how he was a big believer in plot devices, for example. Uh, instead of, he goes, instead of blowing up a room and, and killing someone in it and for going for the shock value, show the audience the bomb, you know, with a 30 minute timer and then show the hero not, you know, being I misspoke. A... Not, not Alfred Hitchcock, Graham Hitchcock, my bad. Oh, okay. Well, when you're coming, when you're talking about ancient civilizations, uh, we should back up real quick, which is, 
I do not think for even a second we're the first civilization to rent this apartment. Not not by a long shot. There are old civilization remnants scattered everywhere. Uh, you know, the sunken cities off of Japan, the sunken cities off of India, the Bosnian pyramids, the real pyramids, Bimini Road, uh, Puma Punku. I mean, hell, all you have to do is watch like a season of ancient aliens because they, they love going out to these places and the remnants are, are striking. So do I think there's uh, older civilizations that are out there? They're easier to find uh, in non-Antarctic areas where they're, they're not covered by snow. Are there possible ancient civilizations that are buried out there? Sure. Sure, why the hell not? Uh, it wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. I think that every civil... Because this place, the way it was built, it wasn't just a one-off. So, you know, our civilization goes unbroken maybe back 5,000 years, give or take. Well, before that, you know, there's all sorts of remnants that, that, go, that, that go previous to that. So why not? I think ever, after every civilization runs their course, however it's going to run, then they are told to move off and, you know, kind of like a senior class. Got to bring a new class in. You guys, you don't have to go home, but you got to get the hell out of here. And, now, Mark, yeah, have you have you seen the pyramid shape in uh, Antarctica? Yeah, I have. I mean, I've seen. There's all sorts of fun stuff in Antarctica. The um, do do I put uh, that much credibility into it? Yeah, maybe, but it's tough to get to. I actually liked the um, the thing I liked more than Antarctica was some of the stuff we were doing, whether or not we found something or we built our own base was the, um, oh, what was it? Uh, I don't wear it. Uh, the Fitbit. If you guys remember this a couple of years ago where Fitbit was allowing, you know, was showing some of the tracking motions because they, they were proud of it. It's like, oh, look, we have GPS and you can see people, you know, moving around different cities. And then all of a sudden they realized that military guys were wearing these things. And all of a sudden they were, they were showing, it's like they were, they were showing them going around these, these structures in different parts of the world where there were no roads <laughs> you know there was these secret bases and one of them was in antarctica and so uh, but yeah the, the whatever's in antarctica i believe it uh but there's no way to confirm it at the moment um a good segue from possible ancient civilizations is another question from base Groip: are aliens real we have a first-hand testimony from astronauts claiming aliens are real, but no first-hand accounts that the Earth is flat. Is this because aliens are just a decoy to throw us off the sun? No, no, I, I don't think that at all. Um, I think, well, I think the government has kind of stretched aliens and pushed them into the, uh, aliens are from Mars and Venus and Jupiter and, and that sort of stuff and the whole space alliance. Do I think there's aliens up there? Or do I think there's stuff flying around? Yeah, I do. All day long. Um, you can go back. Most people don't know that the, the greatest UFO sighting wasn't Roswell and it wasn't 1899 Aurora. It was um, 1561 Nuremberg. And you can look this up. I mean, it's not, again, not a secret. The 1561 event uh, over Nuremberg, Germany, where these giant space armadas just came over the city and just started hammering on each other for a full hour. Um, I, I personally have, you know, you can buy night vision binoculars on Amazon for like 500 bucks. Binoculars not monoculars, and you can watch. The sky is just crawling with things. People forget that UFOs, that 99% of them, the, they aren't seen. UFOs are like cars. They work just fine with their lights off. But since they run absolutely silent because they're unified field engines, you don't know they're up there. I mean, literally, they could be flying over your house at 100 feet, and you'd never know they were there at night. And if they're using any sort of cloaking technology, well, you're just not going to see them anyway. So do I think there's there's things flying around? Yes. Um, and run by other civilizations? Yes. Do I think they're from Mars, Venus, and Jupiter? No. I think they're just older versions of us. I think they're just previous classes of the same school or, or the same apartment building that's, uh, that are allowed to kind of do their own thing, but there's rules in place, which means you know they're not allowed to just land in the middle of downtown anywhere. And get out and, s and take a few selfies and sign a few autographs and wave for the cameras. Because that would, you know, look at the, what was it? I think the second Star Trek, uh, recent Star Trek movie, where immediately a religion is formed uh, instantly. Which is kind of the, the running joke of um, what if a, a giant spaceship landed, you know, a giant golden spaceship landed somewhere where the TV cameras were. Two things would happen. One is, you know, people would, would be, the, the science fiction crowd would be like, oh, wow, they do look like the people from Avatar. But there'd be a whole other group of people. It's like, oh, yeah, we're going to found a church immediately and, uh, and follow it. Um, so to go back to some of very confused previous questions, he now added that he says, 
there is no difference in pressure between space and the edge of the atmosphere okay. because the density of the atmosphere is zero at the very edge. This is because the atmosphere becomes progressively thinner as you reach the edge, right. eventually reaching zero. There is also a graph uh, that I left in the chat, and he says this is why it's not sucked off the Earth. What do you think of this? It's, again, the, the math does not hold up, meaning, again, thermal dynamics. You can look this up. Pressure cannot exist. I'll say it slow. Pressure cannot exist next to non-pressure without a barrier. Meaning, and you, you just imagine, okay, imagine a room that's half of it is filled with ping pong balls to the ceiling and the other half isn't. And in between those two is a clear plastic sheet. The clear plastic sheet is the only reason the ping pong balls don't spill into the other half of the room. That's the barrier principle. That is thermodynamics in its most basic form. If you take out that barrier, the balls have nowhere else to go. They have to move into the other part of the room. There's, there's nothing you can do to stop that. So why don't our hydrogen atom, I'm sorry, molecules and our helium molecules and everything else, why when they get up to a certain level along with the other fluorocarbons, why don't they just go off into space? You, there is no practice. I, I understand what you're saying about the math, because again, science had to say something. They're saying, oh, no, gravity's hold. Their science's basic thing is gravity, even though science absolutely positively cannot tell you what gravity is. They can only tell you what it does. There are so many quotes from scientists. They say the same thing. We have no idea what gravity is. We can only tell you its symptoms, the side effects of gravity. We can't replicate it. So, yeah, and you can throw me all the charts you want. Show me a practical application. Show me. And again, this, this goes back to what you were saying at the very beginning. This is a bias of authority. At the end of the day, when you're just believing something that comes from academic, uh, you know, which oh, yeah. is an authority, you're just going uh, oh. to eat it up. But if you can't necessarily prove it, like why can't we um, put into uh, a study um, this gradient effect and how we can contain something with a perpetual gradient? Why? Because we can't replicate gravity? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean... You're absolutely right. The um, the science, there was a line I used in my speech last year, which was that science is only right until the day that it's not. And I'll give you a perfect example. I, I don't know if I remember talking about this last time. The coelacanth fish. I love this fish so much. Well, I started to sound like Trump just then. It's really, really great. It's a phenomenal fish. It's an incredible fish. <laughs> it's phenomenal. So it's phenomenal. <laughs> so, no, I like this fish. It's great. So, um... So this, the coelacanth fish, C-O-E-L-A-N-C-A-N-T-H, coelacanth, right? Prehistoric fish, dead for 75 million years, extinct, 75 million years. Everyone knew it. Every scientist in the world would have bet the freaking farm on it, that it, it was super, not just dead, really, really, really dead. And then they caught one in a net off of Mad uh, South Africa, and then another one off of Madagascar, another one off of Mozambique, but it turns out they were all over the place around Africa. Yeah. So oh. why, how did science screw that up so badly? How did they all, every single one of them, wh wh how did they screw it up so badly? And that's because once, this goes to the foundation of the evidence, because they saw the fossil and they said, oh, we carbonated this fossil. It's obvious the fish is dead. So we, it's extinct. There you go, 75 million years. And, the, and again, they, they resisted for the longest time. People kept showing fishes. It's like, look, it's swimming around. It looks identical. They said, oh, they, they just had to make up terms for it. They had to absorb it into science and make up a reason somehow, which was, oh, well, it's a, it's a living fossil and it's an evolutionary state of stasis and stuff like that. So when people come at me now and they say, oh, do you believe in the Loch Ness Monster? And I go, oh, do I think there are plesiosaurs swimming around the Loch Ness? Um, and I say, why not? And they go, well, it's been extinct for at least 100 million years. And I show them the fish. <laughs> and I say, now tell me again why, why there's nothing swimming around the lake. Here's the thing. If that fish would have been even a little more elusive, if we wouldn't have caught it in 1940, if we would have waited, you know, until now, until somebody, again, I could, I could have caught it on a rod and reel right now, taken a, a, a movie of it, fired it off to a university, you know, say, let's say it wasn't discovered, and they would immediately come back and said, oh, you're faking the whole thing. That's not the fish. They would have been in denial for years over it. You know, even though it's like, look, it's right here. The science, they, they make statements without, they, they take leaps of faith. And I'm sorry, and I'm not picking on the guy here that's showing me charts about, uh, you know, what's happening with the atmosphere. But again, remember, they, they've had years and years and years to try to explain this because mm -hmm. they can't go down my road. 
because it's like because gravity they know full well that the vacuum will beat gravity every single time so they had to come up with this it's like well it just gets weaker and weaker until it gets to the point where there's this edge where the vacuum doesn't affect the molecules even though it violates thermodynamics you're saying that nothing basically doesn't affect you know it doesn't suck off those random molecules that are just sitting there really when 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 does that ever 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 happen it doesn't Sorry, well, it's a it's a pressure that, it, um, it's a pressurized system. What he's saying is that uh, what gravity does is it creates this like gradient in the atmosphere where the edge there is no difference between the edge and the vacuum of space. It's it's non. Yeah, uh, again, that's impossible. It can't. It, it doesn't work that way. It's molecules versus no molecules. Molecules will always equalize. Always, 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 always equalize. That's what they do. I mean, again, it's, it's, and I know the, the t it's tougher for people to understand because we, yeah, we're not taught physics. And that is, we're not talking about air versus no air. We're talking about air versus nothing. Uh, and because it's, we can't see it because it's transparent. We don't have a, we don't have a, a concept of, of nothing because a vacuum chamber looks exactly the same as what's outside the vacuum chamber. But you got to remember that inside a vacuum chamber, <laughs> It is absolutely bare of anything. There's no oxygen. There's no nitrogen. It's negative pressure. We're, it's, it's kind of like, well, you know what it is? It's, it's no different than water, really. We're, we're kind of just living in a thin version of water. It's mostly nitrogen and mostly oxygen. If you take any bucket, you know, anything of water and you expose it to an area that doesn't have water in it, it will always rush in to equalize. Always. You know, you like half a bathtub, half of it is, is filled. The other half is empty. You pull that barrier. It will always equalize out. And that's what we're talking about here. I get it. I know, I know <laughs> what science says, but that's because they have to say it. They can't just leave a question mark there. They can't say we have no idea, even though they have no real idea. Same thing with gravity. You know, if he's going to go down that road, have him explain the gravity thing to me, which is what is gravity? Neil deGrasse Tyson not shy about it other science other physicists said the same thing we don't know what gravity is it's a magical molecular force that pulls things down to the core of the earth and i say well it's a magical molecular force that pulls things straight down there you go yeah that's okay. um we'll we'll give it a little more time for uh, more questions to pop in okay. uh for the AMA. However, I do have some other questions that I would like to go into. Sure. Uh, I was trying to save Base Grape's question of are you willing to be forthright in pointing out the group that is responsible for the Round Earth conspiracy. And last time you were on, yeah. we talked about various conspiracies, including sort of like world orders and mm -hmm. things like that. And so what I was wondering is recently I've came into um, contact with some people who were telling me conspiracy theories revolving around uh narcissism and this like religious war that's going on hmm. uh, do you have any knowledge of this sort of conspiracy uh, not really because it gets what i like to tell people is there's so many different theories about the groups the the first rule of power has never changed in all of civilization which is stay hidden uh, the and that is you can talk about the Bilderbergs and the Rothschilds and then the Trilateral Commission and the Council of Foreign Relations and the Vatican and the Jewish Cabal and on and on and on and it was like which one is the most important and you could really rile conspiracy people up because none of them are, are going to agree on the like the top ten everyone's got their own uh, opinion on, on who's got I mean right now you're you're you know with what's happening with the virus you're going to blame uh, completely different groups um, as far as a religious war you know the the good whole good versus evil thing i don't know because once you start going down that road it, it mostly turns biblical and i know that this is not exactly one of those shows even though there are a lot of people recently that are saying that what we're running into right now is is turning into some sort <laughs> sort of biblical prophecy which it very well might um but i think there's some things missing i don't think we're, we're quite there yet i don't think there's any sort of tribulation happening uh, I don't know if that sort of helps or if I'm kind of rambling in the wrong direction. Uh, no, I think um, it helps. I'm going to ask, because uh, Cosmic came, when he, he was talking to us earlier before we started the stream about this, mm -hmm. um, when he went into the Flat Earth server asking them, you know, telling them to come to the stream and 
what questions they wanted to ask you. Uh, mm -hmm. A big thing that they were talking about was uh, you being controlled opposition. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. What is your, yeah, I, I'm sure you've come into contact oh, since, with this before. Since, what, are, since, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, since day freaking one. Um, and that all stemmed around one guy, and that was Eric Dubé. Uh, and I remember vividly because I was in Boulder, Colorado, and I had just done my third interview. I mean, literally just my third interview. And one of his people contacted me and said that, um, well, Eric doesn't like the way you're doing interviews and you really need to do this. You're like, stop mentioning Crow 777 and using his moon footage and, and stop saying this and stop saying that. And if you don't, he's going he's gonna to come after me and try to discredit me. And then Matt Boylan did the same thing really like right on top of each other and I, I said look i don't really know either of you guys so go ahead you can you can do what you want what i didn't realize was eric had a, you know and matt both had a lot of people that were you know pretty big channels way bigger than mine at the time and so they said oh yeah mark's controlled opposition and so i kind of had fun with it and said well uh, i mean anyone that has met me for even five minutes knows that i'm a huge dork um, I, you know, I, we're talking about a guy that, that literally played video games for a living and owned a comic book shop, uh, before getting into tech support for 20 something years. Uh, so yeah, anyone that thinks, thinks I'm controlled opposition, oh, please tell me what my master plan is because I've been doing this now for five years. I'm not yeah. sort of, you know, weird David Icke character. Uh, I've been... Yeah, that's something, uh, that's something that I was telling them was, you know, I've spoken to you on the podcast and I've went down your channel and you've made hundreds and hundreds of flat earth videos for five years. Yeah. Um, and you don't seem to be, you know, profiting heavy off of this sort of uh, no, content. No, no, yeah, no. So I don't see why anybody would dedicate no, no. five years of their life to be controlled opposition oh. without a profit incentive. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, no, for me, it is, uh, it was just something, again, I, well, I tried to, I told people in the documentary, which was, uh, look, I didn't pick Flat Earth. Pla Flat Earth chose me. I didn't have to do a damn, I didn't have to do a damn thing. All I did was... Uh, um, just say yes to anybody that called up and and i mean i didn't like the my book publisher I said hey we'd like to turn your clues into a book it's like okay the documentary guy said hey i'd like to fly out fly up and and uh, take you out for pizza and talk about flatter it's like okay and i just kept doing the same thing over and over and i never changed my message at one the, what, the easiest thing to spot for any sort of and i i honestly do not think there's any sort of um uh counter intel or, or any guys like that um in the, the community at all because it's looked at so weird, you know, it's so polarizing anyway. And we're, we're, it's a fairly tight knit community, even though we do fight, um, that you'd be able to spot them in two seconds because they'd go off road and try to take it in a direction that, um, that we didn't want it in. And those guys are usually ostracized anyway, like Mad Mike, for example, you know, Mad Mike, he, he wasn't co-intel, he just had his own agenda. He was doing his own. Um, he was doing his own thing. He was in it for the the, the glory and the girls and the money, and uh, and you know, talk about karma. You know, he signs that deal with the Science Channel, and then before the first episode even airs, he crashes in the desert. So no, no. Oh. Was, sorry, co, co, the am I the if I, I'll say I'll tell you guys what I told everybody else, and I think I said it at the very beginning, which is if I am controlled opposition then i am the greatest secret agent of all time because nobody has found anything on me and i make myself as transparent as possible my name's out there my address my phone number you can look up any you know any part of my history uh you know yeah well interestingly about that right mm. so i mentioned to him you know seems like a very genuine guy and i mentioned that there's no profit incentive and this is where they got deeper into a conspiracy. Would you be willing to talk further about these conspiracies of you being controlled opposition? Sure. I don't care. All Go right. ahead. Why? Are, there, are, so, are you talking about now or later? Oh, now. Oh, now. yeah, yeah. Fire away. What do you got? Yeah. So they said that the reason uh, you would do this uh, with no profit incentive is um, because – it's something to do with your family they mention and they mentioned these all these uh conspiracies about do you know what mk ultra is yes of course yeah so they would uh they would link you to mk ultra are you aware of what the donna's trio is no i've never heard that term uh it, it's a band right so you know who metatron incorporated is uh, is that a band too Oh, wait, what? Oh, uh, oh no, Met no, Metatron. Yes, of course I know who Metatron is. Yes. 
Yeah, so what they were... So then you know Metatron. They made your app on the uh, the Play Store, the Flat Earth Clues app, right? Yep. yep. And so they what they do is essentially <laughs> they link you to the COO of that company, right. uh, Dennis Luca, uh, who and... was involved in the Donis Trio, and there was MK Ultra symbolism involved in the Donis Trio. And so they believe that you perhaps partake in some sort of like a family lineage tying to MK Ultra and controlled opposition to hide the truth about the flatter oh, lord okay so <laughs> the no no it's no it's fine the the metatron thing that's like 4 years old now but that's fine so what happened was back in the beginning cuz i say yes to everything there was a guy from San Diego um and it wasn't just Dennis Sluka there was another guy uh Joe Real Okay, so the the actual guy that was that was the head of that, his name was Joe Real, and he called me up and he said, "Hey, can I turn your clues into an app? No different than the publisher out in London." And I said, "Yeah, sure. Do I have to do anything? No. All you have to do is is make some of your content. Um, uh, don't publish it on YouTube. Just let us publish it first on the app, and so we can have exclusive things." And he also it wasn't just the app; he also bought MarkSargent.com. And it's like, okay, sure, I don't care. I mean, what I didn't know how big this thing was going to get, and. Then he said, "He said, oh yeah, um, we're gonna make MarsSargent.com like a pay site, and we'll give you half the uh, give you half the money." It's like, oh, do I have to do anything? No. It's like, great, fantastic. You go have fun with that. And of course, he didn't. You know, he didn't like a lot of producers. I mean, pe people don't know how. It, you know, even though there was a contract in place, it was a pretty, it was a light contract, and I didn't. It wasn't any money out of pocket for me. So we we never really talked again, and people looked into it. Now, the reason why, and this was partially, this wasn't Eric Dubay, this was ODD. Uh, that was another guy named Matt. So it, the, the channel's called ODD Reality. Um, he's a guy out of Denver, Colorado. ODD stands for Overdose Denver. And he looked into Metatron. That was the parent company. By the way, we're talking about parent companies. We're talking about one guy, two guys tops. That, that run these things. They're just corporations by name only. There's no real employees or anything. And there was... Um, uh, so Joe was actually being... The, the story goes is that Joe was actually me. I was Joe Real. And I actually worked for Sony and I was a Sony executive and I was doing all these things. And I was like, no, I'm not. To the point where Patricia Steer and I had Joe on her show. And then immediately... And he gives, again, this is why it's a losing battle to even try to fight trolls in, in this era. He, even though he was on the show with us, they said, well, fine, Mark isn't Joe Sluka. I'm sorry, Mark isn't Joe Real. He's obviously the VP, Dennis Sluka, right? Is that right? Right, Dennis Sluka? <laughs> and that, that's how it carried off. And it's like, no, no, I have nothing. Metatron built the app and that's it. That's, I never got paid a dime for the freaking app. Uh, Joe and I, in fact, Joe keeps writing me like every three, four months as this thing keeps bigger and bigger. He wants to sell me MarkSargent.com. And every time he, 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 the price just keeps going up. I think it's like $5,000 at this point for MarkSargent.com. It's like, keep your money. I don't need it. You know, I, I have enclosed world.com and, and my channel is Mark K. Sargent. So I don't, I don't need it. But no, there's nothing, there is nothing in any way, in any shape or form, find it. Find me tied to any sort of sinister force. I, I, you know, my backstory is about as clean as, as you can get. I can tell you every, every step of my life, I can tell you where I was. Yeah, uh, it seems very odd to me, right? Because like, you do have a history. You mentioned you worked in proprietary software. You were a pinball wizard. Oh, yeah. It seems so odd to me that just one day out of nowhere, it turns out you were running this big company. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No, no. I mean, I was. I was doing proprietary software in Colorado. At no point was I working in... in um, and I was... The um, Metatron isn't even based out of Los Angeles. It's based out of San Diego. And I was in San Diego for a comic book convention, I think, back in 2004. But that was it. Uh, there was no, I, no, I had nothing to do with Metatron. It was literally just the guys that called up and, and did my, my app. And, uh, but no different. Again, producers call all the time for different projects and some work and some fail and some, for whatever reason, get tied to stuff. I mean, you know, last year I was called for the, um, I was contacted for the, um, TV show, The Amazing Race. And that crash and burn, they were going to do an internet only version with nothing but YouTube personalities. And they couldn't pull it off because, uh, well, it turned out it worked out pretty well because the virus would have wiped out the season anyway. But they couldn't, <laughs> they couldn't do it because every, everyone that they called, like, so like they called like, um, 
uh, Shane Dawson or Logan Paul was the first thing they said. They, because what you don't know is when you do shows like that, you, um, you can't be on the internet for the entire month while they're shooting. I mean, literally, you have no access to anything. You can't do email. You can't do phone calls. You can't do anything. So these guys would come back. I didn't care. It's like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. Um, but they, these guys came back to him and said that, uh, well, how much are you going to compensate us? You know, for, if you have a channel that has 5 million subs, you can't be off the internet for a month. That's a death sentence. So anyway, the season collapsed. But the point was, if I got on that, can you imagine what would happen then? Oh God, I would have been tied to all sorts of nefarious things. Um, so there is another question that popped up in the AMA, but before I get into that, yeah. um, I was just wondering, you know, did you expect anything like that to happen being in the flat earth community which is inherently tied to conspiracy theory did you ever think like perhaps one day these conspiracy theories will start to revolve around me and there will be communities thinking i'm now oh yeah yeah you know? yeah yeah absolutely no no question um i knew enough about the conspiracy world that i i predicted it i said look in fact i watch it happen with other people when you get above and there's this funny there's youtube videos that actually talk about this when you get above a youtube channel size i think it's around twenty thousand. i could be wrong it may have changed recently but once you know like ten you you're fine you're totally legit it's kind of like an indie band you're totally fine until you hit a certain number. And then once you hit that number, people start looking at you with squinty eyes. They start saying, hey, wait a minute. Why is he getting popular? What, what's happening here? And I did the same thing. I'd look at other channels and, and say, oh, wait, why are they doing this? And why are they doing that? And, uh, and it is. There's, there's a real garage band mentality to it. To where everybody's, you know, if you know anything about garage bands, you know, everyone plays the same bars and they're all friends. And they go drinking together and everyone's in the same thing. And then all of a sudden, one of them breaks out. What, what do all the other ones do? They immediately turn on them. It's like, oh, man, you used to be at the, about the music. Now you're all Captain Sellout. I was like, what are you talking about? I didn't do anything different. <laughs> all I did was say, yes, yeah, somebody, you know, they, they came to me in, in my cases. So, no, I, it was, didn't surprise me in the slightest. And it doesn't bug me. Um, because I, as transparent as they get, if I had something to hide, if, if no one's found anything on me in five years, if Metatron's the best you got, and that was from four years ago, pfft, I don't have anything to worry about. Find the bodies first, then maybe you'll have something. So from Ariel, CEO of Science, he asks, um, this is a bit of a long question. Yeah. Uh, how do flights work on a flat Earth? For example, a flight from Perth to Johannesburg, about 11 hours long, flight distance of 8,300 kilometers, yep. flies at an average speed of 755 kilometers yeah, yeah, an you, hour. You don't have to read the rest of this. I, I can fill the yeah. blanks in for you. The question is when a fl there's a really long flight and it's shorter than what it should be given the cruising altitude of the plane, can you explain it? No, I can't. Uh, do I do I know there's something wrong with our map and our perspectives? Yep, I do. Is there possibly a jet stream issue that we don't know about? Maybe. I don't know. Um, that, that question was based off of, because the initial clue I wrote for that was clue seven. And in the Flat Earth Clues, which talked about how plane flights um, are always double connections. When you're talking about Southern Hemisphere to Southern Hemisphere, be it South America to Africa to Australia to New Zealand, there are always these weird connections. They always go north, and the distances are twice as long as they should be, and they connect always through the Northern Hemisphere. And every pilot I've talked to said it doesn't make any damn sense. 95%, even now, 95% of the flights in the Southern Hemisphere are not direct flights. They're, you know, where you're going from continent to continent, even though they should be crossing very simple distances across the oceans. And then, and I said, find me a, a nonstop flight from this th place to this place. And eventually some people found, they found out like a handful of, the, of them. And they said, explain it. Hey, and, I, and I said, hey, I second. can't really tell you other than, again, what I try to explain to people is when they, when they give me this, I say, prove the route. I go, fine, you have, a, you have a nonstop flight from point A to point B, prove the route. And by that, I mean, show me the latitude and longitude coordinates for the entire flight which is why I came up with the whole magic show clue, which was clue number nine. That was the follow-up to it, which I said, don't you, didn't you find it strange? Cause they didn't, they just like, Oh, you could book the flight. I go, fine. Show me the route. Meaning when a flight takes off, when it gets about 150 miles offshore of wherever it is outside of ground radar range, the flight disappears. Literally the latitude and longitude coordinates disappear and they go into estimated or approximated, which is a nice way of saying, we have no idea where the plane is. 
and they do not reappear until that plane gets close to whatever continent they're going to. So, fine, you have a nonstop flight, show me the route. Show me how, where it went before it blinked off the plane. And I stared at, again, the Clue 9. Watch it. It's, it's fascinating. You can check it out on your flight tracker yourself. They can't manufacture the data. And that goes in, I know you guys probably aren't old enough to remember, or maybe you are, the Malaysian flights that died off in the Indian Ocean. The, um, uh, especially the one, the 777 flight, which was, you know, a flagship. They never did find the black boxes. How is that even possible with the GPS system? How can you not, t they couldn't even tell you where the flight went down. Well, how is that even possible? You know exactly where that flight is. You have satellite coordinates of that, where that plane went down. No, they didn't. And they don't tell people. When you're flying, uh, if you're 150 miles offshore of any landmass, they don't know where you are. They get to have radio communications with you. They know approximately where you are. They don't know exactly where you are. There you go. Um, Very Confused says, how can you reconcile your beliefs when you can't even propose an accurate model? Oh, and this, this, by the way, whoever this person is, is, is a veteran globalist, which is fine. Uh, I reconcile my beliefs because the globe model is torn down. When we tear down the globe model, we don't have to remember what I said in the beginning. You don't have to. I can't tell you exactly what the flat earth model is because we don't know. All I can tell you is, which is why everyone in the community agrees on one thing and one thing only. And that is it's not a globe. It goes with that whole reasonable doubt thing. We You tear it down by yourself, which is also, by the way, whether our retention rate is so high. I don't tear down the globe for you. I don't even tell I don't even tell you how to tear down the globe. You tear it down for yourself. And once it's torn down, you can't go back to it. Do we have an absolutely perfect um, model? Nope. Not at all. But it's good enough to where our community just keeps growing and growing and growing. I've heard that argument many, 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 many times over the last five years. Doesn't phase me in the slightest. Um, Ariel, CEO of Science, um, gave me this like diagram of the yep. transit of a flight from a, a flight from Perth to Johannesburg, yep. showing the red line, which is a flat Earth trace placed on the round Earth. Right. Yeah, show me, again, show me the latitude and longitude coordinates. You can draw things like that all day long. Show me the actual route. Give me the data. You can't. I tried. Um, I, so, just, I have a question if you want to uh, if you want to just get away from continuously, you know, going back and forth with this guy. That's all right. What? What do you got? Um, is, is that okay, Cosmic? Is that a... Oh yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, I just before um you know before we start uh, getting too far away from one of the topics we were discussing earlier, Antarctica. Where, Mark, where do you think Colin O'Brady fits into the uh, the narrative of Antarctica? This is, this man is he the guy the that he, um that supposedly drug that four hundred pound sled? Yeah, that guy. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And what do you want me to tell you? The GPS system not only tells you where you think you are, it'll also tell you what it wants to tell you. When it comes to Antarctica, he just went across supposedly a skinny part of Antarctica. He didn't cross the entire thing. And if you put it on a flat map, he just went from one little small section to another small section. Now, do I think that him hauling around that 400-something pound sled or whatever it was, I know it was multiple hundreds of pounds, do I think it's a little sketchy? Sure. Uh, do I think it proves the globe in any capacity? Nope. And if it did, then why is the community still here? Well, I guess why I brought that up was to to consider a lot of people think that, uh, you know, there's military, heavy military action in Antarctica. So they say, well, yeah. you know, well, well, look, he could go there. You know what I mean? So, oh, I mean, yeah, yeah, no... yeah. No, no. Well, yeah, that's an excellent point, which is um, it goes along with the Antarctic Treaty. The only people that get to go there in Antarctica, again, corporations, private corporations cannot set up shop there. The only people that are allowed to go there are military and military scientists. And the bigger thing is when you go there, you are you have to submit a complete itinerary of everything, every little last detail, and it has to be signed off by multiple countries. So by the time they you you know, you're actually out there, they know full well in advance and they will guide you through GPS. Because remember, when you're if you're doing that sort of thing, 
uh, which is another question was like people say, well, why don't you just hire a pilot and, and make a break for it and try to make it to the edge? I go, but you know, a pilot that's willing to fly without using GPS. And the same thing with um, the O'Grady, which is, you know, he used GPS to do this. GPS is going to steer him in a certain direction. And it says, oh, yeah, by the way, you just completed. You just made it through the through Antarctica. And he had to basically say, oh, OK, he had to agree whatever with whatever the software told him. And again, the GPS system is the military. It's the United States military, DOD, Department of Defense, created in the mid 90s, along with everything. Yeah. All, all our best toys are military. People like even what we're talking on now, people keep forgetting. So oh, the Internet's a private thing and it should be for everyone. It's like, what you, why do you think the Internet was built? <laughs> it's a military backbone system. The, we're just talking on the remnants of it. The, the really good stuff is, is what the military runs. I, th I know. I, th I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I think that's, that's you definitely added some wisdom uh, into that mm. that conception, because um, at the end of the day, yeah, people do. He was on the Joe Rogan podcast, and people do seem to forget, you know, the path he actually took. Um, yeah, yeah. When you when you look at the map, it's really short by comparison. He literally found the thinnest part to go across, and again, I people can believe what they want. The question is, why did he do it? You know, but. But this is my point in the timing. The timing to me was interesting because I had a friend tell me about some of this stuff. He's like, you know, man, this was like probably like six years ago. He's like, you know, man, you can't go to Antarctica, man. He's like, yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll get uh, shot by the military. I'm like, I don't know, man. You sound kind of nuts. Yeah. But then when you when you look into it, this was in, I think, 2018. So it just almost, it almost fits into a good time frame for these people, right? To have some guy there. Oh, yeah. To, to yeah. sound like it's all Oh, good. yeah, absolutely. There are so many. I have never seen a conspiracy like flat earth where the other side of the chessboard has been actually you can actually see pieces being moved um one of my favorite is the um uh the picture of earth from space which is again this is not secret information the first full disc picture in sunlight picture of earth from space is from 1972 apollo 17 known as the blue marble shot and you can look it up all day long and it was so interesting to me, and I, I haven't used this one in a while, but I, but I will real quick, which was when I was running a, a tech support uh, thing in when I was doing proprietary software in Boulder, Colorado, I wanted to put different images of the earth on all these different monitors for the tech support team that I was running. And I was going on the internet. You know, the internet was not the greatest back in 2000, but it was up. It was, it was running. There was some stuff on there. And I was looking for earth, images of earth from space and just about every Boolean string, every variation I could think of. And I just kept seeing one image. And that was the Apollo 17 image. And it was just rows and rows and rows of the same freaking image. I'm going, NASA, you suck. How is it there's only one picture of the Earth from space? You know why? Because there was only one picture of the Earth from space. And I did not know this until 2015, after we had already started doing our thing, when Obama came out and said, oh, yeah, by the way, there's a second picture of the Earth from space. Blue marble shot. And, you know, taken by whatever, I, I can't remember which, who, who took the second shot, um, but it didn't really matter. The point was, is there was 43 years between the first and the second shot. And for people you know, look in, in astrophysics or astronomy, that's forever. You're talking most of the 70s, all of the 80s, all of the 90s, all of 2000, 2010, and halfway through 2010, 2020. No pictures of the Earth from space were ever taken. Until, and, and not only did Obama put it out on Twitter, that it's like, oh, yeah, this is the second picture of the Earth from space. Scott Kelly wrote the press briefing. Scott Kelly. So it's, it's yeah, it's staggering. What, uh, again, the timing of that. It's like, really? So now, as we're starting to talk about this, they started pushing back when we started pushing. And they, and they just gotten worse and worse and worse. Um, yeah, one more yeah. thing let me throw out really quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is the, um, the YouTube scoreboard. I, and people said, oh, you're delusional. Um, where uh, when you go into any search engine, you type in whatever, potato salad, tractor maintenance, whatever, you'll get search results equals a number, you know, 58,000, 24 million, blah, blah, blah. And YouTube was the same way. You know, YouTube's owned by Google, a search engine. And literally, you know, since YouTube was created, you could type in any topic into YouTube and you'd see search results equals a number. And we were tracking this like a scoreboard because we noticed that when we first started out in 2015, our search results equaled 50,000, which is the combination of videos and references and, and mentions. And it just kept going up and up, you know, 3 million, 5 million, 10 million uh, to where we were, we were outpacing just about everybody. And I remember in the summer of 2018, because I thought it was going to take about another six months to catch uh, President Trump. I said, um, I said, I said, somebody called me up. They said, oh yeah, we, we caught him. 
And I think, what was it? 20 point, we were at 20.9 million and he was at 20.8. And I actually made it, you can look it up, it's on um, one of my Strange World episodes. I literally titled it, Flat Earth Catches the President of the United States, which was fantastic. And then the most unbelievable thing happened. Two weeks later, a friend calls me up and he goes, he goes, yeah, the scoreboard's gone. I go, what are you talking about? They stunt us, you know, is the filters not working? He goes, no, man, it's gone. Search results equals a number isn't there anymore for any topic. And it never came back. And then and people, and I said, holy smokes, they did it because we, we you know, we, because we were trending as f so fast that they, we, we were the only one, you know, that whole, you know, we got more, look at the score. We were doing that so often that they couldn't do anything about it. And somebody came along and said, well, forget about stunting the algorithms or anything like that. Let's just tear it down. No, hardly anyone uses it anyway. But it's search engine 101 and they tore it down because of it. So they, yeah, they're making moves all over the place, all over the place. In fact, you know, even though someone might say, I'm oh, sorry, I know I ramble, but let me end this part with this, which is when they came out just recently with that whole flatten the curve thing that we've been hearing for the yeah. last six, yeah, six yeah, seven yeah. weeks. People are saying, I go, wow. I go, I, people have asked me, it's like, are they making a nod to us? I go, wouldn't surprise me. I, I'm not going to discount that in the slightest because flatten the curve sound is, sounds way too, uh, way too much like they're trying to either build it into the lexicon or build it to where it drowns out all all the other stuff that we're doing um aerial ceo of space was wanting to ask oh, how God. would there only be two full pictures of earth when there are satellites like the himawari 8 satellite that take geostationary pictures every 10 minutes? yeah and to ask him when the himawari came out after 2015 and when, why did we never hear about this? And why isn't it an American satellite? And also with the Himawari satellite, which I love so much, first off, the data is cached in advance. You can look at this, go straight to their, uh, their website. It's absolutely templated. Everything is laid out and built from scratch. Is they're not actually photographs? But here's the other thing I thought was interesting about the Himawari satellite, which is supposedly a geostationary satellite. You can, you can get one of two things now. When it, when it comes to photographs of the Earth from space or movies from the Earth, you can either get the Earth rotating or you can get the weather moving, but you can't get both. So the Himawari shows wonderful cloud formations. Oh, look, the weather's moving, blah, blah, blah. But the Earth isn't rotating. And you say, well, because it's geostationary. I go, fine, then show me another satellite that will show the Earth rotating in the weather moving a little bit. Show me that. Where is it? doesn't exist but it says here that the Humari 8 was launched in october 7th of 2014 yeah it's not when it went online not a chance we didn't see those images till after the second blue marble shot was taken okay and he can go he can go back and forth with me all day long if he wants to i i know he's a globalist he's never ever going to cave in but you know i've got the it, for me it comes down to this are there plot holes and, and himawari is not one of them uh, are there plot holes in the flat earth? Sure, but there's way more in the globe. And when it comes yeah. to plot holes, we can explain our model way easier than the solar system can explain theirs. And and it's more it's more constructive, right? To, like like what Mark was saying, to speak about, you know, these chess moves because you can you can go from this bias of authority. I mean, this this guy doesn't not you, Mark, this other gentleman, he probably yeah. doesn't really fundamentally have an idea of what he's talking about then i'm well, not trying to I mean, he you, he does in right? the way that look i don't i don't blame people kind of like what's happening with people that are wearing masks right now i don't blame people that follow science because look they they read the books it's in their heads they regurgitate it and that's what they believe I, it's I, i'm not gonna I, I can't get mad at them because look i used to be on that side of the fence the problem yeah. is is the more you try to it's kind of like the five stages of acceptance, you know, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, which is in t most people on that side. If again, if you have a bachelor's degree in any in any physical science or higher, there's nothing I can do for you. You're not breaking out yeah. of it. There's there's nothing. You you are sucked in because you are never going to get past denial. Well, and even if you went past denial, you're going to get thrown straight into anger. So it's fine. Again, he can he can quote he can quote the, the textbooks all he wants, 
But yeah. there's a lot of things out there that are, there's a lot more things you can't explain in the solar system model than there is in the flat Earth. Uh, what, was the, what was one of the most late, um, the most recent ones? Oh, I don't know, the Mars rover. So forget about the VHF transmitter that's on the, you know, the 1969 VF, uh, VHF transmitter that can't, shouldn't be able to punch 250,000 miles, you know, through the Van Allen belts with pinpoint accuracy. Forget about that. Tell me about the Mars rover that died years ago. Remember, a battery can only be charged and uncharged so many times. We're not talking, you know, a car battery only lasts six years before it's dead. And if you guys know anything about car batteries, once it's dead, it's dead. It's, it's a rock. You, you have to throw it away. There's nothing you can do for it. The Mars rover died at one point because the battery died. And then something like two years later, it came back to life. And it's been sending images back. Good ones, like high def images, even though it's using very simple technology, right? And it's punching unimaginable, forget about hundreds of thousands of miles, millions and millions of miles. Perfect clarity. This thing's still running around, even though it's, it, they can't explain it. It, and the reason they get away with it is because the average person, forget about the physics, they don't know anything about engineering either. So it's like, oh yeah, the Mars rover, still working. Really? How long are you going to let that go? 20 years? 30 years? How? How are you going to explain it? And if he's going to go down that road, sorry, I'm not trying to get mad or anything. Tell me why no one's gone back to the moon. Tell me why yep. no one's gone back exactly. since 1972. The Americans... Exactly supposedly you know went six trips no one ever died nobody had an accident so oh, don't don't give me this crap about apollo 13 what the chinese nobody went the russians just quit during the space race the chinese didn't go and by the why, way uh, why did the uh, apollo 11 astronauts come back and like two out of the three of them became like heavy alcoholics oh yeah like heavy drinkers. yeah absolutely like absolutely no question um there, in fact i was talking to a, a science girl heavy science girl out in um uh belfast and she was, you know, I threw this question. I go, why haven't we go back to where we are? And I go, when? She goes, soon. And that's what I keep hearing over and over again. It's like, we're going back soon. We're going back soon. It's like, really? Because every president of the United States since Reagan has said that. We're recommitted to going back to the moon. Reagan, Bush, Clinton, the other Bush, Obama. I mean, we're talking decades of presidents keep saying this thing. We're going back to the moon. Even Trump. Oh, not only are we going back to the moon, we're starting up Space Force. No one's going back to the moon. Elon Musk, 2017, said, oh yeah, by 2018, we're going to send tourists around the moon. It's 2020, hasn't even started it. Uh, there was a Google X Prize. Look that up. Tell me why the Google X Prize never happened. Tell me why there's only six countries. Oh, <laughs> here's one real fast for you. I don't know how much longer you want to go. But the, the, the um, real quick, which was the, uh, oh, what was it? So if you look up countries with launch capability, there's only six countries with launch capability right now, right? Launch capability, right? Six. And you probably know who they are. And it, what struck me last year was when Israel, I talked about them earlier, Israel supposedly sent a capsule to the moon and then not no people in it and crashed it, just face planted it into there. You look up on, on Wiki, they're not listed as having launch capability. So how'd that one get screwed up? How, 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 how did Israel get launch capability? You know who was in that control room during that entire mission? NASA. That's how. It's brilliant. You, see, you take one still shot 20 miles out, and then, oh, wow, we lost communication, and supposedly 15 feet before it hit the ground, a major malfunction, and it crashes, and that's it. Nobody even talked about it ever again. Brilliant. Freaking brilliant. Um, so, um, uh, from very confused, he was asking, uh, why do you think our understanding of gravity is so incorrect if we have used it to nearly perfectly characterize the motion of the planets? Are the planets also fake? If so, how would you explain my ability to pull out a telescope and track them for myself? Okay. Um, how many more, how many more questions after this? Cause, uh, galaxy has like three. Okay, good. We'll end after his questions then. All right. So I'll, I'll keep this one quick. When it comes to the sky, because people say, are the other planets fake? No, I'm not saying that they're fake. I'm just saying that they're lights in the sky. What you're seeing in the sky, the stars, the planets, the sun and the moon, is just the oldest clock system ever built. Designed to pre it predates language. Meaning, it doesn't matter what language you speak and where you're from, you can figure out kind of what's happening because of, the, um, uh, because of what's happening in the sky. You don't even, you don't literally don't even, don't even need a language to figure it out. Um, when people say, oh, I've seen, I've gotten in arguments with astronomers. 
and they say, um, oh, I've seen the moons of Jupiter with my telescope. I go, fine, it's great. Take a pair of binoculars, go into a planetarium. When you're in a planetarium, can you see Jupiter? Yes, I can. Can you land on it? Why not? Well, that's because it's just a light on the ceiling. That's all we're talking about here. The, the gravity and, and projecting the motions of the planets. Look, we've been able to track the planets literally for millennia. It's not because they could track the planets without gravity. If you want to build gravity into the equation, then sure, that's fine. But the zodiac and the astronomy and uh, as astrology charts have been there for a long, long time, way before we got here. Oh, and sorry, one, one, one more real quick. If we're going to do that, tell me why the zodiac hasn't changed in thousands of years. Meaning, we're talking about the absence of parallax. Absence of parallax. Meaning, um, parallax yeah. means you, when you're driving down the road, you know, the, the mailboxes go by quickly, but the mountains in the diff distance go by slowly. Why? Because the mailboxes are really close and the mountains are really far away. So if you have stars that are 10 light years away, mainstream science, and you have other stars that are 10,000 light years away, and you're traveling through your, you know, depending on which, which angle you're talking about here, whether the solar system traveling at 500,000 miles an hour, or the galaxy moving at millions of miles an hour, those stars should be moving out of place. And you're saying, well, the distances are so big, we wouldn't be able to tell. I'm going, okay, fine. Not five years, not 10 years, not 100 years, but the zodiacs have not changed. They're still there. They have not changed. A couple thousand years, and you're telling me the stars are showing no parallax at all? No, not buying it. Next question. Uh, Galaxy, what were your questions? Yeah, so um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, yeah, just have some easygoing conversation because I know we get into some uh, a lot of detail there, Mark, and I appreciate it. I'm sure everyone you know listening does too. Um, but just w one last thing to go into Antarctica, yeah. and this is something that this is something that touches on um, you know people's uh, people should be able to try. People should even if you, you know you're pretty in, you're indoctrinated, you should be able to take a step back and try to see these chess moves because even when you look at world war ii okay the world and the war ended in 1945 yeah. correct yeah. so that's what we're told so why why in like a couple years after the war supposedly ended did you have three uh military um na basically naval armadas leaving from three different continents going to antarctica right. operation high jump had uh, i mean i don't know the exact no no i could pull it up it had uh, you know, four thousand seven hundred men, thirteen ships, thirty-three aircraft. Yeah, it was a it was a full-blown carrier group. Why did the youngest admiral in the history of the navy, right after the signing of the the surrender at um, in Tokyo, I believe, why did he leave? You know, instead of enjoying his retirement, why did he go down to back to Antarctica, leading a full-blown carrier group? Absolutely right. So, and what do you think they faced out there? Because uh, stuff was sunk, like a boat sank, I think. Yeah, where, yeah, not, yeah I'll, I'll tell you the story I like more than most, which is, I like the one where, so were they trying to root out the Nazi base? Yeah, probably. The, the most people don't know is that Anti during World War II, there was literally one country in Antarctica, and that was Nazi Germany. And wh sure. why not? And that is, and it, keep trying to remind people, like, all's fair in love and war. If, if the Indiana Jones Chronicles, that was not some just made up thing. And that was Germany was really hot and heavy. It's like, look, if you could find something to help you win the war, they're going to go look for it. If Harry Potter's wand was real and it could help you in the war, oh, they're going to find it. They are going to search this thing out. So the Ark of the Covenant or whatever. They heard there was weird stuff in Antarctica. Great. The story that I like more than most is that while Nazi Germany was down there, because remember, we didn't hear from them really after that, except for the South nope. American stuff, boys from Brazil. Um, which was that they actually asked asylum from an ancient civilization that was there that said, look, uh, can you help us out here? And the, the civilization said, okay, here's the deal. We'll, you, you can, we'll grant you asylum, but you can't come back. That's it. Sort of like leaving a, um, a high school dance type of thing. You know, you get a stamp on your hand, or if you don't get a stamp, you're like, you can't come back. You can't go drink it in the parking lot and come back. <laughs> And that's, that's the story that I like more than most because it seemed to fit all the bills because whatever happened between during Operation High Jump didn't even seem to concern Admiral Byrd when he was on television in 1954. Meaning whatever happened during that whole thing wasn't even a blip on his radar. Like it was over for a while, you know, several years. And that kind of makes sense. It's like, okay, Nazi Germany left. And, you know, who knows what happened to them? You know, were they punished or, or, or were they just, you know, made second-class citizens? Who knows? But they weren't an issue anymore. 
and they never became an issue after that. I mean, yes, I know there's some remnants lying around here, founding NASA and other stuff, but uh, that's that's what I kind of like. I mean, there's other people that said that you know that that the United States tried to face down this ancient civilization that was down there, and they couldn't do it. Now, of course, there's one more theory, which is that Nazi Germany. Um, developed some advanced technology during the short years that they were down there and they beat back the Americans and whoever else was helping the Americans. Yeah, maybe. But if that was the case, wouldn't you think they'd push it even a little further? Uh, uh, AKA Iron Sky style. If you guys don't know what Iron Sky is, the movie that was never really released in the States, you might want to check that out. Um, so yeah, any of those things could, could happen, but whatever happened, whatever happened, I don't think the Nazis are still there because we just kept, um, uh, we, we took over at that point. You know, we, we secured it as a, as a military thing. Now, I don't think they would have allowed us to do it. But maybe, I, I don't know for sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. And there, uh, there you know, there, there was one man, I, I forget his name, um, but I think he was the Secretary of Defense at the time. He, he was in a hospital, right? Maybe James Forrestal? I think, and he, uh, they basically pushed him out of a window. Oh, and he was yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to look up some interesting th stuff on that, the James Forrestal um, politician, uh, he or Secretary of Defense, uh, yeah. he was... Um, and he was talking about advanced propulsion, you know, something about UFOs. Yeah, you know, so. look up the stuff. Watch the movie, I think it was from the late 80s, um, called uh, Roswell, um, mm -hmm. starring, oh boy, the guy from Twin Peaks. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Also, the guy from Dune. But Forrestal was supposedly, he knew too much, and he was one of those people that objected, which is he didn't believe in what I like to call the greater good. And that is, if you're in a military group, it's like you have to think about the greater good, which is, okay, what's good for the empire? Do the people need to know certain things? Sure. Do you tell them everything? Do you give them complete transparency? No. Um, uh, Roosevelt said it best. He said, you only give the public as much truth as they can handle. Because if you give them too much, they're going to freak out. Look at what happened with Roswell when the, the initial papers came out. People were losing their minds. And then they backpedaled really, really quickly. Um, so, yeah. It, did Forrestal get thrown out a window because he knew too much? Yeah, probably. Yeah. No question. I mean, yeah. That's, it's definitely an interesting... It's definitely an interesting, interesting thing to think about. Because, uh, you know, especially with the whole... You know, mysterious nature of uh, the Nazis' advanced propulsion technology. Yeah. You know, they offered, uh, well, I think think about this. I do, do you have any other questions, or, or can I just run with? I I literally had one uh, other one that still tied into the Nazis. Oh yeah, go ahead, and go ahead, throw it, throw it at me. I mean, the, the, literally the only thing I wanted to tie into as well because they were obviously making um, trips to Tibet and they and they were looking for you know like basically subterranean civilizations. You can look at the uh, the Order of the Green Dragon. Yeah. They were teaming up with the jet this jet. Japanese order yeah. and these guys were all found you know in a line literally killed themselves honorary honorary style yeah. knife through the stomach in the uh, suburbs of um of um Berlin mm. after the war and these these two orders right with Japan and they were working with the Dalai Lama yeah. and they apparently found some stuff so you know how does that fit into the flat earth narrative right oh, it, wouldn't, like the, it wouldn't surprise me at all and it fits in just fine because the subterranean, especially because uh, I initially got into this because I was going into Hollow Earth. And if you, the, one of the biggest names in Hollow Earth happens to be Admiral Byrd, which was the same guy that's tied to Flat Earth. And that's how I got connected because I thought, okay, well, he discovered something at the North Pole, some Hollow Earth entrance, you know, journey to the center of the Earth thing. And I thought, okay, that was in 1926. I thought, well, that's where he'd spend most of his career, keep going back. But no, that's when he went to Antarctica, which was, I think, at that point, it's like, okay, what's, what is the real shape of this world? Because the Hollow Earth wasn't enough. Um, does the hollow earth conflict in any way, shape, or form? No, it does not. Because civilizations, especially this one, the one that we're in, for example, and we'll go back to Air Pressure Boy, who's probably still in <laughs> chat, which is most of our civilization lives from zero to one mile up, 5,000 feet, give or take. That's most of our civilization because altitude sickness kicks in at about 7,000 feet. And that's a very, very narrow, narrow margin, zero to one mile. So if you had a cave that was even 100 miles high, not even 100 miles. You could you could hold a, a civilization very comfortably. You got to remember that our, our best civilian aircraft cap out at 50,000 feet. That's 10 miles. Spy planes at maybe 20 miles. You can make that cavern 50 miles. And and you'd have plenty of room. Tons and tons of room. So, and, and by the way, um, and maybe we should end it on this, which is 
But do, again, ties back to um, what happens to civilizations when they're done. Do they get to go, do they have to go to subterranean? Yeah, maybe. I mean, who's to say right now that we aren't ourselves living in some sort of subterranean cavern and the ceiling is just this giant display system, which is underneath something much, much bigger? Uh, I think I think it's very very possible. So did the Nazis possibly find them? Yeah, why why not? I think the Nazis had advanced knowledge way ahead of the years. And people forget that that they almost took the whole thing. They literally they were the closest group to actually taking the entire world, and mm -hmm. and they almost had it wrapped up. I mean, Russia was in flames. Uh, England was hanging on by a thread. The only thing that was saving them was that little ocean or that little inlet. Um, and America, the, the big thing was that they had tons of German citizens over here. I know I came from one of those groups out in Wisconsin. There's tons of German citizens uh, in the United States. They wanted to take the United States without firing a shot. They didn't. The last thing they wanted was to have the United States involved in the war. And the weaponry that they had, the, you got to understand, they had stuff that was so far above what, what, what we had. I mean, forget about the assault weapons and the tanks and the planes. The, their V2 rocket program was staggering. Their cruise missile weapon program was, was staggering. They had cruise missiles, for God's sakes. They had, yeah. at the end of the war, literally at the end of the war, and I know my grandfather was one of them, a, a German jet plane flew over them as they were moving, moving closer to Berlin. They had jet planes years wow. before we ever had jet planes. It took us forever to try to re, um, reverse engineer that stuff. And so where did they get it from? The story goes, if you believe in it, uh, that, you know, where yeah. we had a Roswell thing that happened in the late 40s, they had a Roswell incident that happened in the 30s and that it landed in soft ground and it didn't hit in the desert and just break up into pieces. It just kind of hit the mud and it was perfectly intact. And they re-engineered a whole bunch of stuff from it and got the edge. And, you know, look how close they were. I mean, literally, if it wasn't for America entering the war, we'd also be speaking German right now. Which is a whole, let me, sorry, last thing to end it on, which would be, that ties into let yet one more conspiracy, which is Pearl Harbor, which is, did Pearl Harbor happen? Did, was it allowed to happen? It's like, what you, would yeah. you be willing to do to protect the United States? Would you be willing to sacrifice part of an outdated Navy and 3,000 men to do it? Because if Pearl Harbor isn't attacked, then a million men don't enter voluntarily into the service the very next year and the American military machines start ramping up. If that doesn't happen, we are all speaking German right now, and parts of the world would be in literal flames. So, there you go. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Anything, anything uh, else I can do for you guys before I go? Uh, yeah, there's, there's one last question. Uh, that somebody had. But... Yeah, I know. Uh, if you don't want to take it, it's fine. No, that's fine. What is it? What is it? I'll answer funny. it real quick. Yeah, so uh, they mentioned in reference to the... Uh, flight patterns uh the same question goes for ballistic missiles why would the direct path for potential nuclear strikes on russia territory be over the north pole why would the no uh no red radar stations be posted in northern canada if the earth is not round how can you even possibly say that the earth has to be around for that sort of situation first off it's theoretical because you don't have any of the military data I mean, the radar stations are where we say the radar stations are, and the missile paths that we're supposedly going to fire is being projected on a globe model. Put it on a flat model. See how, see how different it is. There you go. And by the way, that's one of the more original questions I've gotten, but it doesn't change anything. All right. Uh, yeah, that was good. Uh, so thank you so much for coming on, Mark Sargent. Oh, yeah. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. You're a very interesting man. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, thank you very much for having me. I hope that the Gray Room uh, does well. And uh, um, if you guys need anything else, just feel free to track me down. Uh, remember, my channel is... Uh, oh, in fact, don't even forget the channel name. If you want to find me, just go on YouTube, type in Flat Earth Mark. And uh, there's a cool app out there, which I'm supposed to mention, even though it's not my app. Uh, which is actually a full-blown app. It's called the Flat Earth Sun, Moon, and Zodiac Clock app. That's really, really cool. It'll answer. It's got a wonderful Q&A feature on it. What was that app called? Flat Earth Sun, Moon, and Zodiac Clock. Sun and Moon and Zodiac Clock. Okay, yeah, I see it right here. It's an educational app. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on, uh, Mark Sargent. And if I have any events in the future... Uh, I'm more than willing to, you know, have you come back on oh, and you sound pretty keen on coming on. Sure. Uh, 
so yeah, thank you. All right. Hey, you have a good one, guys. Thanks, Mark. Right. See ya. You too. Bye-bye. Cheers. See ya.